This panel is titled, December 7, 1941, A Call to Service. And on this panel are five individuals who each have an interesting and unique perspective of where, where they were and what they were doing on December 7, 1941. In a, in a manner that's very similar to September 11, 2001, where this generation remembers distinctly where they were and what happened on that date. The generation of the Great Depression remembers December 7th, 1941, just like the generation of the 1950s and 60s remembers exactly where they were when they learned the news that President Kennedy had been shot. These five panelists all bring to the table uniqueness and interesting perspective about the day that the United States was drawn into the Second World War. The great transforming event that transformed the United States from being a nation that was largely isolationist to a nation that joined the global war against totalitarianism and fascism and then went to war with the two greatest powers in the world, Japan and Germany. I am going to briefly, let me just outline how this panel is going to function and apologize first of all for starting a little bit late. Um, this panel was scheduled un, um, unfortunately at the same time that lunch began. Um, the panel is going to function like this. I'm about to introduce each of our panelists. Each one of them is going to be then invited to speak briefly about, in about a 10 minute format about their experiences on December 7th, 1941, where they were, what they were doing. Um, and then after each one of them speaks, we are going to open the floor up to questions and answers. And so today will be your opportunity to speak with each of these individuals and ask them whatever you would like to ask them. I would call your attention to the fact that there are two microphones, one on each aisle, and when we move toward the question and answer segment of this presentation, please feel free to step right up to the microphone and I will call on you to begin. And now on to the introductions. Seated on the rostrum, beginning um, on my left, your right, are five panelists that each bring um, an amazing and unique perspective to this subject matter. And they are, beginning just here immediately next to me, Mr. Don Stratton, who was a crewman on the battleship USS Arizona on December 7, 1941. <laughs> Seated next to Mr. Stratton is General Brigadier General Gordon Gale. And General Gale, in 1941, was a recent graduate of the United States Naval Academy, having graduated in, 1930, in 1939. And Brigadier General Gale continued to serve as a Marine officer through the end of the Second World War and beyond. <laughs> Seated next to General Gale is Paul Kukuyu, who brings the interesting and unique perspective of a merchant mariner. It's often overlooked and forgotten that there were multiple branches of the United States military in World War II, and the Merchant Marine was a militari militarized branch of our service. <laughs> Seated next to Mr. Kukuyu is Dorinda Makanaonalani Nicholson, who was a resident of Oahu Territory of Hawaii on December 7th, 1941, and offers the perspective of what it was like to have been a young girl at the time of the attack. And then seated next to Dorinda is Zinji Abe, who was the pilot of an Aiki D3A1 or VAL dive bomber on the Imperial Japanese Naval Aircraft Carrier Akagi and flew during the second wave of the strike on Pearl Harbor. Thank you for coming from Japan, Abe-san. So each of these five individuals has 
an incredible and unique perspective of what happened. Oh, yes, Abe san. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Genji Abe. Uh, at uh, about nine o'clock in the morning, December 7, 1941, I was attacking Arizona by Harlow. I'm very much pleased and also honored with this opportunity. Okay. At this point, I'm going to ask each of the five panelists to, in a format of approximately 10 minutes, tell us about where they were and what they were doing on that day. We're going to begin here next to me with Mr. Stratton. Mr. Stratton, could you please tell us about what you were doing on December 7th, 1941? Well, it started out uh, Sunday morning, just as usual, uh, board ship. Clean sweep down in Chow, and uh, we just finished chowing down and I picked up a few oranges to take to a buddy of mine down to Sick Bay and walked out on the bow of the Arizona and some sailors were yelling and pointing toward Fort Island uh, doing some bombing over there and I went and took a look and sure enough and about that time the planes made a bank and I could see the Japanese insignia, and I thought, uh-oh, we're in trouble, and so I started for my battle station. My battle station was a side setter in the port and the aircraft director, one deck above the bridge where the captain and the admiral were both killed that day. There was about, it takes about eight or ten men to man that uh, director, the pointer and the trainer and the side setter, and the, a couple of fire controlmen and a gun captain and uh, a few things. We uh, got to my battle station. Of course, the general quarters sounded. This is no drill. This is the real McCoy. General quarters, all man, your battle stations. Well, at that time, I was uh, there, and uh, all we could do was we had some ready box ammunition behind each gun and on four port, port and aircraft guns. And uh, we broke some locks and got some ammunition and started firing at some of the planes. The, we couldn't fire at broadside where the torpedo planes were coming in because the vessel was tied out outboard of us, her bow to our stern. But we could fly, fire at the high altitude bombers, which we couldn't reach because we could see our bursts falling way short. Uh, with more courage that day and more valor, more sacrifices that I could see from my position looking down over the deck where my shipmates were. Uh, only 344 men escaped that that day. Uh, we were all burned and we when all the firing uh, we caught this bomb that hit the starboard side of the number two turret and about a million pounds of ammunition, fuel, and what exploded, blowed 110 foot of the bow of the ship off a battleship 306 feet long. Uh, the fuel caught a fire, it burned for three and a half days. Uh, we were still trying to fire at the higher altitude bombers, but we were, we run out, finally run out of ammunition, and uh, our gun captain went down to see if he could arranged for some more ammunition and <clears throat> we never did see him again and he didn't make it and I'm sorry for that. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyhow, we, after everything kind of, a ball of fire went about six or seven hundred feet in the air and just engulfed us, the whole superstructure of the bow of the for, uh, foremast of the ship, which in, in, enclosed us and we were all burnt and Pretty much, and I was burnt over 60 or 70 percent of my body. We had no way of getting off, and uh, first, like I said before, the vessel was alongside. 
there was a seaman on board there. We got his attention and he threw us a heaving line and we pulled over a heavier, li heavier line. And we proceeded to go across the, this line hand over hand, which you can kind of visualize in your mind. We were probably about 40, 45 feet in the air. And uh, across the ship was 110 feet wide, so 54 foot of ship and it was burning and the water and then onto the vessel. We proceeded to go hand over hand across that line to the vessel. And that was after we were all burnt. From there, they put us on the vessel for a while and they got us in a motor launch and they took us to, to uh, the U.S. Naval Hospital there in Pearl Harbor. So after a while there in Pearl Harbor, uh, of course, everybody was hurt real bad, and there was a lot of burnt victims, and mm -hmm. the nurses uh, couldn't figure out a way to give you a shot of morphine, and who had a shot, who didn't have a shot, who had two shots, whatever. So they started marking on the foreheads or on the chest or something with lipstick. That, so you could tell when you had a shot and if, whatever, and uh, so... Uh, they decided to send us back to the U.S., uh, some of us, and they, I said, well, I'm ready to go. Well, we don't think you can make it right now. Uh, you're too, too badly hurt, burned. I, I said, oh, I can make it. They said, well, if you get up, stand up while we change the linen on the bed, we'll take you. So I came back on the USS Scott to the United States, uh, Maryland, California, where I spent for about a year in the hospital in the burn uh, section. After that, they transferred me to Corona, California, to a convalescent area. And I took some leave and got back. And uh, well, that was about it. I, after that, I, I I was medically discharged at the end of 42. And I was home for about a year because my whole left side hadn't healed up very well. So in the first part of 44, I decided to go back in the service again. Well, I couldn't go because I had to go through the draft. So I had some friends on the draft board and they took me through on the draft board to Omaha, Nebraska, and it took me about five days at, in Omaha to get permission from the Navy to go back in the service, which I recommended my same service number, which I got, which I'm really happy to have right now, that it, both of the records are the same service number. Anyway, uh, they said, well, we got some good news and some bad news. You can go back in the Navy, but uh, that's the good news. The bad news is you've got to go through boot camp again. <laughs> I'd already went through boot camp in, in uh, Great Lakes, but this is the time I had to go through boot camp in Farragut, Idaho. So I went through boot camp and caught up my shots, and I was a recruit, recruit CPO. And I pushed 120 men through boot camp. I could have stayed there and till the end of the war, I guess, if I don't want to. But I wanted to go to sea, so they sent me to Treasure Island, and I went aboard a, the DD-406, a USS Stack, a destroyer. We proceeded to the South Pacific and uh, participated and in, helped in invasions of uh, all of New Guinea, Hollandia, BWAC, WIWAC, both invasions of the Philippines, Okinawa. We're on picket patrol in Okinawa for a number of months uh, when they're getting uh, probably four, the suicide bombers were getting about five ships a night there sometimes. Anyway, they sent me back to electrical hydraulic school in San Diego, California, and, and uh, I went home on leave for a while, come back, and uh, the war was over, so I had enough points to get discharged because I'd been in the Navy before. 
Well, anyhow, they, I had to finish the school before I could get out. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I did that. <laughs> and I got discharged the second time in uh, St. Louis, Missouri in uh, December 1945. I go back to Nebraska and uh, met and married my wife of 56 years. No more. And that's why we're and that we're here right now. I guess I I uh, enjoy pretty good health. I play a little golf once in a while. They're going to have to uh, PGA is going to have to change the scoring system, or unless I'm going to have to get older faster <laughs> if I'm going to shoot my age. <laughs> But yeah, you know, bless this United States and bless all you people and thank God we're here. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Sh Mr. No. Mr. Stratton, I have two quick questions for you. Um, first of all, when did you join the Navy and um, what was your role on the Arizona? I believe you were a gunner and what kind of weapon were you on as a gunner? Well, I was a sight setter in the Port and Aircraft Director on 5-inch 25 fixed ammunition anti-aircraft guns. But, uh, we've done a lot of a lot of maneuvering, a lot of practice, a lot of shooting down drones. Uh, uh, had a lot of practice before that, but uh, it was 5-inch guns. 5-inch 25s, later graduated to the 5-inch 38 semi-fixed ammunition on the destroyer. And now I got out of the service as a second-class gunner's mate. Excuse me. Sorry. Do you believe that um, any of the 5-inch 25s on the Arizona brought down aircraft that day on December 7th? Did we brought any down? Oh, well, I'm sure we did, but you know, it, it's like... Uh, there's so many ships firing. <laughs> you don't know what you build it to hit who or what, <laughs> or what ship can constitute a, a shoot down or whatever. Because everybody was firing and uh, the cloud was just, or the sky was full of shells bursting. Uh, who got who and who got who did or what? We don't know, but uh, they did shoot down a few aircraft. What year was it that you joined the Navy? Pardon? What year did you join the Navy? 1940. And, and why the Navy, just out of curiosity? Why not the Army or the Marine Corps? Well, I don't know. I, I think I was just an old uh, dry land, uh, flat land farmer boy, and I, the Navy seemed very appealing. And uh, in the 30s, you know, there wasn't very much cash around. And, so boy, when they offered $21 a month, that was pretty good. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Mr. Stratton. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that account, and also thank you very much for coming here today. And now we're going to move on to Brigadier General Gale. General Gale, sir, could you please tell me about where you were and what you were doing in December 1941? Do you mind if I stand up? Go right ahead, sir. First off, I'd like to ask how many people here were present at the earlier period when we had those Medal of Honor people? Okay, thank you. In a few words, I'd like to point out the contrast between my experience and this gentleman's experience, and the name for it is the fortunes of war. He had a very exciting day. I didn't. I was in the eastern North Carolina in the Piney Woods in a little town called Trenton, North Carolina. It was, I was there because it was near a Marine group and a place called New River. It has since been named Camp Lejeune, and probably a lot of you have heard of that. It's named for the man who was our, the most distinguished Marine in World War I, and who then commanded the Marine Corps for seven years. And to the extent that an individual inevitably puts a large stamp on his organization, 
General Xiong was the man who put the biggest stamp on the Marine Corps you have today. Some of us have had a hand in it since, but he's the leader. But I was in Trenton, North Carolina. Now, most little towns have a crossroads, but Trenton didn't have that. It had a place where you went into the middle of the village and turned left. There wasn't a crossroads there. <laughs> they claimed they had 250 people. I claimed they were counting the cemetery and the dogs. But there were four Marine families who were living there because, like me, they were stationed down at New River, now Camp Lejeune, and we went back and forth every day when we could find our way through the fog and, and smoke of the forest fires that seemed always to be burning there. But on that particular Sunday, my bride of six months and six days we were in our first year of our marriage, was entertaining. And we had about four couples in our little apartment for Sunday dinner. And we had sat around and, and enjoyed a very nice Sunday dinner and had just finished it when the news came over the radio that we had been attacked in Pearl Harbor. The reaction was universal and absolutely the same for everybody. Those little yellow so-and-sos, we'll get them. And that was, that was everybody's instant reaction. There wasn't any conversation about it or anything. That was just the reaction. Um, I can't even remember whether we went back to camp then or waited until we got some sort of a message to go back. But I'll go over with you briefly the people that were there. The state policeman and his wife, who lived in the same house that had been subdivided into four apartments, they were there. A battalion doctor, a Navy doctor that was our battalion surgeon, and his wife were there. Uh, a couple of bachelor lieutenants. I was a second lieutenant, as, as all the other officers were, were there. And there was one fellow there who was a bachelor lieutenant, and he was there because he had shot the goose that we were eating that day. <laughs> and my wife was trying to pay special honor to him, and it was a good goose, I must say. <laughs> he didn't make it through the war. He was killed on Guam. Everybody else that was there that day made it through the war. The only other thing I'd like to say to extend that luncheon is to reflect on how rapidly cha things changed. I've talked about the fortunes of war now. <clears throat> I was a second lieutenant, two years out of the Naval Academy. Two years and one month later, I was a battalion commander in the middle of it in the Pacific. And one of the features of young professional officers in that war and in that time was early responsibility. I want to ask all of you how you would have felt at age 26 to be responsible for a thousand people like you saw today in that earlier show. It was a big challenge. Thank you very much, General Gale. Um, and if you wouldn't mind, could you please share with the audience um, some of where you went and what you did subsequent to December 1941 during World War II? Sure, sure. We, we continued in New River training. We were the first Marine Division. We had been formed just about a year earlier down in Cuba. And we were training there, and that training consisted of receiving more people, training them, transferring them out to other units, and doing it again. About six months, almost exactly six months later, we got on the trains from New River and went to Norfolk and got on the ships in late May of 19. 40, 
41, 42. And we sailed for the war, we did not know where. By this time, we were captains. And I'd had, you know, a full five months as a first lieutenant. And uh, we got aboard ship, we went down the east coast of the United States during the month in which the German shipping, German sinking of our ships on the east coast was the heaviest. So we had that to, experience. We did get a torpedo across our bow, didn't get hit, went down to the Panama Canal. When we got to the Panama Canal, we got word from a man who had gone down where we were headed that there were, wasn't any whiskey down there. So if you're going to have any, you better bring it. Well, in the Panama Canal, you can buy lots of whiskey cheap. And we formed a quick officer's mess and bought thousands of dollars worth of whiskey. <laughs> and then we went through the canal, and I turned at one point to one of the officers on the ship. Of course, I was a salty captain by then. I'd been a captain for three weeks. <laughs> I said, you know, we're going out there without any escort. He says, oh, it's a big ocean. <laughs> well, it was, and, and nobody shot at us on the way. But we did go through some terrific storms where you can stand on, we, we had a ship that had 3,000 people on it. It was a big ocean liner. And when you can stand on one of those and look up at the waves higher than your mast, you're in a storm. And we went through such a storm on the way to New Zealand. When we arrived in New Zealand, we were greeted very warmly in every sense of the word, by the New Zealanders who were glad that it was us that was greeting them instead of the people that were coming their way. And, and they were coming their way, and we thought we were going to be there for six months training. And we took just long enough to go 30 miles out of town, build a camp, come back in town, sit in a theater, not everybody, but important people like captains, and operations officers of battalions and of regiments and the division staff. And there was this huge map up there. Yeah. Altogether about the size of this screen in back of me. And one of my fellow young captains leaned over to me and he said, Gordon, he says, that's that big picture they've been telling us about. <laughs> it was a place none of us had ever heard of, Balkanau. And so they explained to us that we were going to go there and what we were going to do and how we were going to do it. We all went back and made our plans for our particular units. At that stage of the game, I was a, an operations officer for one of the battalions that was going to make the first landing on Guadalcanal. And so we uh, got our start in the war that way. I will only say that for the landing at Guadalcanal, we were totally surprised. We landed on a beach which we had shot the bejesus out of, and nobody was there. So that was a, a, a great surprise and a great welcome. As you know, the Japanese reacted strongly, and there was a long contest for who owned that island. After that, we went back to Australia, and they immediately proceeded to ship us out of northern Australia to southern Australia, because we all had malaria. And they had all the Anopheles mosquitoes they needed. And so they sent us down south where there were no Anopheles, and we trained down there for about eight or nine months, and then went to New Guinea. And we didn't do any fighting in New Guinea, but we did continue to train and march around the jungle and the woods and try to condition ourselves for that kind of a climate. And at that time, MacArthur was rebounding from the initial fate that befell him, and was starting his drive toward the Philippines. And in order to make that drive, he had to go through a passage between New Guinea and New Britain, the Vietas Straits. We owned one side of it, but the Japanese owned the other. So they sent the 1st Marine Division to land on the western end of New Britain and seize that part of, of the island to secure that passage through there through which all his forces had to go in his future campaigns. 
After that campaign was over, we were sent back to rest in the Russell Islands, and our chief protagonists there were rats. All the coconuts had laid on the ground for about a year now, and it made all the rats real healthy, and we had to move in and set up a camp there, and so we fought rats for a while. <coughs> then we got aboard ship, and we went to Palau, to an island called Peleliu, which was on MacArthur's flank. As he, was, as he was going to go, and he hadn't yet gone into the Philippines, we were on the flank, and our charge was to take the most important airfield that was threatened him from that side. And we made the landing at Peleliu, and it was a very bloody affair, both during the landing and afterwards. And uh, by that time, when that was over, um, I had lost 50% of my men and 60% of my officers in, in my battalion. And I was one of the more successful battalion commanders in, in those terms. By that time, I'd been overseas two and a half years, and I was sent back to the United States to teach in the Marine Corps schools at Quantico and met my 26-month-old son, whom I'd never seen. Well, thank you very much, General Gale. And as you can see from that account, um, Pearl Harbor, for so many Americans, was a life-changing event. After having drawn the United States into the war, people like Gordon Gale then um, proceeded to go overseas to strange faraway lands and spend a great deal of time overseas, not meeting their young sons and things like that. Well, we're going to move now on to Paul Kukuyu. And again, Mr. Kukuyu was a merchant mariner. Ed, could you please tell us where you were, what you were doing, and a little bit about the merchant marine during World War II? Well, on uh, Pearl Harbor Day, we, were, we had just left the canal the Panama Canal. We were in Seattle and we were going to Baltimore. I was on a merchant ship at the time. And uh, we got news that the Pearl Harbor had been bombed. But uh, by, the two, by the time we got back to Baltimore, the ship was painted battleship gray <laughs> for camouflage. And we were probably the first ship that came into port with the full ship fully painted. And a lot of people don't know, but the Merchant Marine lost more men percentage-wise than any other branch of the service. And it wasn't until 1988 that they were <coughs> accepted as service people. In, uh, in Iceland, it was a convoy made up of 33 ships, merchant ships, going to Murmansk. They had a cruiser, three or four destroyers, mine land ships, and uh, they took the sea to sea for Murmansk, Russia. When he got out outside, the British intelligence got word that the pocket battleship Intrepid was on the loose out in the Atlantic uh, or the, wherever. And they were headed for, for, for the convoy. The convoy had $700 million worth of materials on it. They had aircraft, tankers, and all kind of stuff to help the Russians. Well, anyway, when they got out to sea, they got this bad information that the Intrepid was heading. So the British Admiralty ordered all of the ships back to port, and the, <coughs> the merchant ships were told to uh, fanned out and try to get the port to, to their destination as quick as they could. Well, there were very few ships that made it to Murmansk. And uh, that's about all I, know I can tell you. We, uh, the Merchant Marine played a big part in, in, in winning the war, I'm sure. But with the, without the materials, it would have been pretty hard for them want me or anybody to operate.
And Mr. Kukuyu, I'm aware that merchant mariners um, served on contracts and went out on each individual outing under a contract. How many trips such as that did you make during the war, and where did you go, and what did you carry on those trips? Well, most ships carried the material for, to either bring back to the country. Like one time we loaded manganese ore, we brought it back to the United States, we brought tin from Chile, tin ore from Chile, we brought different things, and we, we brought supplies out to the servicemen too. And also, the merchant seamen sent a lot of soldiers and, and to, they used them transports to tr transport the soldiers from one place to the other. Well, clearly an extremely important role in the overall picture of World War II. Had there not been people like Paul Kukuyu completing merchant contracts and keeping um, uh, merchant ships on the high seas and moving the materiel around and moving the personnel around, uh, a victory in the end may not have been something that was at all possible. Well, shifting the focus and perspective a little bit now, we're going to hear from Dorinda Makana Analani Nicholson, who was living on the island of Oahu in what was then the territory of, of Hawaii before it was a state, and um, was a young girl. Dorinda, could you please tell us a little bit about what happened to you on December 7th? Mahalo. Aloha. Aloha mai to all of you. It is a privilege to serve on this panel with all of these men who did serve in World War II. Looking out at you, how many of you remember where you were on December the 7th, 1941? Okay, they're not, they're not very many of us. And as we are hearing every day, those who served in World War II are leaving us at the rate of a thousand a day. So I'm appreciative of the D-Day Museum to bring these stories together so that we can keep that history. You know, this was a time when I grew up and the world was divided by before December 7th, and after De December 7th. Almost like we, we do and hear on the news right now, before 9-11, after 9-11. I'm sure where we hear are now in New Orleans, it's before Katrina, right? And, and after Katrina, because that does mark your life and that does mark your generation. I was born in Hawaii to a Hawaiian mother and a Scotch-Irish father who chose to live on a small pencil of land, the Pearl City Peninsula, surrounded on three sides by the waters of Pearl Harbor and America's largest military base. Little did we know that we had moved into a neighborhood that would change from being the name of a place to the name of a world event. And those of you who weren't in Pearl Harbor and weren't familiar with the Hawaiian Islands, when you got the news, you probably said, where is Pearl Harbor? We were used to military planes flying over. We were civilians. And yet, with Fort Island being in the middle of Pearl Harbor, which made a, a natural landing strip for airplanes to take off, and to land with all of the men, thousands of men were stationed on board ships and uh, in and around Pearl Harbor. So we were used to the sound of airplanes going over maneuvers. The um, army planes would have mock battles with, with the Navy planes. And one day they would be blue stars and, uh, and we were used to this. But Pearl Harbor wasn't supposed to happen, just like 9-11 wasn't supposed to happen. Perhaps Katrina wasn't supposed to happen. The dams were supposed to, to hold, but it did. And so on the morning of December 7th, it was Sunday. We went to church about 9 in the morning. So at 7.30, Mom was in the kitchen getting breakfast, a usual Hawaiian breakfast. We would have rice with 
some Portuguese sausage, and airplanes were going over. And my dad said, airplanes on a Sunday morning sounds like a lot of them. And then more airplanes went over, and then more. And pretty soon we started to hear what sounded like explosions. And dad said, that really does sound real. And about that time, our house started to shake because of how close we were to the harbor. Out the front door, down the steps, into the front yard, and I went right after him. And my dad and I stood in our front yard, shielded our, our eyes because it was early in the morning, the sun just barely up. And I now know what I saw. I didn't at the time, I just knew I was standing there with my dad. What we did see were the torpedo bombers that were coming in at a very, very low altitude. The canopies were pushed back. The pilots, their goggles, looking out, heading for the ships in the harbor. We stood there and watched. I'm often asked, weren't, weren't you afraid? I think my parents did a very good job. Not afraid, but we also didn't understand what we were seeing. Just like you will hear from many of those who were in the harbor that morning, not really understanding what was, was taking place at that time. Stood out in our street. Our neighbors were standing out in the street watching. We even got into our car so that we could watch even closer. Still not really understanding. And because of what I have written of these experiences, I have been able to meet veterans who have brought me their stories. One story deserved a book of its own, and, and so I was able to meet uh, Mr. Abe, Abe's son. And I asked him, I said, I was a little girl, and I stood in my front yard, and I watched this how come I am still here and the men in the harbor aren't? And he told me that we never were their targets. Leaving the harbor, we tried to come back home and the military police would not allow us to. In fact, we had to get our car off of the road as trucks were going past us with men still trying to pull on pants and trousers and hanging out almost of the back of their trucks. And I wanted to go back home, I'd left my dog. I'm six years old, I'd left my dog. We were not allowed to go back. And my dad remembered above the harbor are some hills with sugarcane growing. So with my baby brother who was two years old in the back seat, my mother and my father we headed up into the sugarcane fields, and this is where we hid, because by now we knew we were under attack. And from our port perch there, we could look down onto the harbor. We could see it burning. We could see flames coming out. We could hear some of the explosions. Now, six years old, more and more who lived in the harbor like we did are now leaving the harbor, coming up to join us in the sugarcane fields. And we as little kids are playing, but we notice that our parents are huddled. My dad is trying to turn the knob on the car radio, some kind of information. We, in fact, I think if there was any fear at all, it was no information not understanding what had happened. And this was the message from the car radio. This is the real McCoy. All military get to your stations immediately. Medical, we need you in the hospitals. Everyone else stay in your house and off of the street. And that was all the information that we had. A little bit later in the day, about three o'clock in the afternoon, our governor came on the radio. 
telling us the same military medical, but now that we are under martial law. Martial law took us all the way almost to the very end of the war. Now the military was in charge. I had left Hula Girl at home. I wanted to go home. The military police thought differently and they took our small neighborhood over to Waipahu, which is a sugar plantation. And there we stayed in, in a hall about this size, wondering what had happened to us. What would happen by the time daylight would come the next day? Martial law telling us that there would be curfews from six at night until six in the morning, you were not allowed out. You could not be on the street unless you had a job that was requiring you, it was important to the war effort. So there would be no school until February. Bomb shelters were built on our school grounds, carried a gas mask with me, and, and my gas mask uh, said child size gas mask. And my mom said it made her feel so sad when I would leave for elementary school and my little brother would leave for daycare with our gas masks across our shoulders. This was what it was like to be a child during that time. The civilians who were casualties of December the 7th, 1941, numbered 78. Again, because of, of what Zenji has shared with me. When the men in the harbor got their guns into position, men such as, as Don, and the shells trying to hit the Japanese airplanes that were descending upon the harbor. And if we missed, and the shells didn't go off, the timing device didn't um, set them off, they came down in civilian areas. And so those are the casualties. Not where I was in the harbor, but those who would be 10 or 11 miles away, parts of Waikiki. And so the youngest to die on December 7, 1941, was only two years old. She was asleep in her crib, friendly fire. And 78, a few of those, a handful, were Honolulu firemen who were killed in the line of civilian duty. I got to thinking that all of my growing up years in terms of elementary school were spent in war years with barbed wire everywhere, the famous Waikiki Beach, that famous pink hotel, the Royal Hawaiian with barbed wire around it. Our money was marked uh, with Hawaii stamped on it, a wartime uh, invasion currency. Rationing began the very day of December the 7th. Interesting when you have a trauma where people go and they go to the grocery store. <laughs> By that afternoon, we were in line at the grocery store and you were lucky if the owner knew you because then you were allowed to come in. Hawaii put themselves on rationing before even those little books with the ration stamps were issued. I've made it my mission to tell this story to those in our classrooms, to keep this history. I am again appreciative of this opportunity to get to hear another set of eyes and ears on World War II. World War II is this huge reservoir. We've, we've heard from uh, Don Stratton and from General Gale and uh, from Paul, and you will hear from uh, Zenji Abe. We all were in different places and we all bring a different set of eyes and ears. My mission is to tell this story through the eyes of the child that I was and to take these, write these stories down 
uh, Mr. Abe's story of wanting to seek peace in his life, I want and have shared that with your children and your grandchildren. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this, and mahalo, ahui ho, until we meet again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dorinda. And shifting again now, um, we would like to hear from Zinjabe. Zinjabe, who flew what is what we called, what the Americans called a VAL, which was a single-engine uh, aircraft carrier-based dive bomber. Um, and he flew during the second strike of the Pearl Harbor raid from the Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi and was involved in the attack on the American cruiser Raleigh. And so, um, Abe-san, if you would not mind, could you please tell us a little bit about your experiences on December 7th, 1941? December 7, 1941, Pearl Harbor attack. The Nagma Task Force of 32 ships, including the six aircraft carriers at Goa, left Hitokak Bay of Sazan Kuri on November 26, 1941. We arrived north of Oaf Island at midnight of December 6. At 3 o'clock following morning, a dual call sounded on Akagi. We up! and take each station. When I entered the air crew samba room, an intelligence staff officer came to us. He related worship status in the Pearl Harbor anchorage. And after that, the American didn't seem to take any special warming system there. But it was a great disappointment to hear that the rotation of aircraft carriers, Lexington, Enterprise, and Hornet were yet unknown. Regrettably, at that time, it was estimated that our 250 kilogram bombs were not powerful enough to give vital damage against either battleships or cruisers because of their heavy armor. For this reason, Daibuma groups were included in the second wave to attack of opportunity, or the aircraft carriers should they appear unexpectedly out to sea. The weather was unfavorable that day to take off from the aircraft carrier. Northeast wind was about 10 meters per second. And aircraft carriers were pitching and rolling more than 15 degrees. Aircraft took off one by one and flew in formation. Likewise, 
each attack group from other carriers took off, making a grand formation over Nagumo Task Force. Commander Fujita was flying his uh, uh, in front of the first wave of 183 aircraft. He waved his hand and saluted Admiral Nagumo. After first wave took off, each ship was behind, preparing a second wave aircraft on the flag deck. <coughs> I took off from Akari, behind nine jail fighters and nine dive bombers of Lieutenant Chihaya. I banged the grain, gained altitude with my second wingman, Goto and Utsugi, that to my left ear, and Kikuchi, Fan Crow to my right ear. Lieutenant Commander Shimazaki was the commanding officer of, of the second wave. And he was flying ahead of 54 level bombers. We, 78 elite dive bomber groups, followed them. I was the squadron, squadron leader in the most position. We passed over the flagship Akagi just one hour after the first wave flew there. We were supposed to arrive off island at 9 o'clock. 35 their fighters were escorting us both sides. The Huey formation kept flying silently. I was thinking about the aircraft of the first wave just an hour ahead of us. Might be arriving over Oahu. At that very moment, my dear Sita Saito suddenly shouted through the voice tube, Sa, to, to, to. The radio message sent by Commander Fuchida, meaning all forces dash in. Just after that, we received another radio message, Tora, 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 means we have achieved a surprise attack. Right after that, I saw numerous tiny black spatters above the cloud bank far away my right ahead. Soon I found that the spatters were a barrage of the anti aircraft guns aimed at the first wave. In fact, their reaction had been so quick that it was hard to believe at the time if the first wave succeeded a surprise attack. Upon receiving another <coughs> uh, order <coughs> from Lieutenant Commander Shimazaki, to today, which means home to assault. I followed after Chihaya's squadron. I graduated, uh, gradually banked right 
and who to are the vessel. So diamond head draw on my dive. And through straight over Honolulu at 3,500 meters altitude, I could see the battleships in Pearl Harbor far ahead, but didn't know which was which, which was sunk, or which was damaged or undamaged. Arriving over Pearl Harbor, I ordered my men to assault and accelerate the descent towards my target. Battleships were moored in pairs along the whole island's east shore, which mean, meant that the first wave torpedo attack could not have been effective against the ships moored inboard. I did my squadron followed me at an interval of 100 meters. Meter. And that was the best position to dive in. At 35 meters altitude, just before reaching first island, uh, Ford Island. I banked to port and the dust in front of the very best position. I set my scope and the biggest ship anchored at the right end. Three stars shooting skyward from the harbor below. Four to my side again and again. 800, 600, Saito shouted out the altitude through the voice tube. Yo, I put the release handle at an instant of his cry, K. I put the control stick, let the air brake to return. I grew giddy for a moment, moment, but flew over the hot island at 30 meters altitude and uh, headed toward Baba's Point. When I flew out over the sea, I told myself, oh, I am still alive. <laughs> Although Saito was watching my men behind, he arrived at the rendezvous point. We arrived at the rendezvous point, some 20 miles west of Kaena Point at 1,000 meters altitude. None of my comrades were awaiting me. However, while I was flying a circle with cruising speed a bit longer, one by one, I gathered up my men. But my second man, Goto, was missing. I noticed almost all of the train had received some kind of damage on their wing and fury. Then I read my squadron north to our mothership Akagi. We could say that Pearl Harbor attack 
was a great success if it was just to gain time to secure natural resources in Southeast Asia. It was an excellent plan considering its originality of the concept scale. Elaborated plans, well-trained crew, all along the line, it was an unprecedented and will not happen again in the future. And it will add luster to naval battle history. However, it was not necessary venture or strategic consideration. The Pacific War did not happen if Japan did not attack Pearl Harbor. I believe further that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were not atomic bombs and we do not have to lose people. Thank you very much for listening. It's often been said by historians um, that if they could turn back time and walk Civil War battlefields with the veterans of the Civil War, or if they could go back to Cuba with veterans of the Spanish-American War, they would love to do it. The opportunity that we have had here today and that we'll have for the rest of this conference is exactly that. We'll be able to experience and interact with these historical moments, like December 7, 1941, with people who were there, people whose lives were affected by it, people whose lives were changed forever by it. And that one event, Pearl Harbor, propelled the United States into war with Japan. And fortunately enough, the events that followed and have led us to this day have developed positively so that we can enjoy people like the four Americans and the one Japanese citizen that are here on this rostrum for this panel. So if we would please join me one last round of applause for everyone. Don Stratton, General Gordon Gale, Paul Kukuyu, Dorinda Makana Onolani Nicholson, and Zinji Abe.